But what uh, Dr. Guy is doing uh, with his company, with his research, is, is going to help every patient in America ultimately. Please let us welcome Dr. Jeffrey Guy. Well, thank you very much indeed, and uh, thank you to uh, Patients Out Time for inviting me to the conference. I'm sorry I couldn't make the Iowa conference. I contracted pneumonia and nearly died at the time, and subsequently contracted diabetes. So if uh, I got a little bit woozy in the middle, you know that's because I haven't uh, had enough lunch. I know quite well, therefore, how one uh, lives on uh, with a drug on which one totally needs for survival. Uh, no insulin, no life with diabetes. I heard this morning some uh, interesting testimonies uh, with regard to patients and their consumption of, uh, of marijuana or cannabis in the, in the US. I took the liberty of putting this slide in my presentation this morning, having heard the presentations. We have a completely different circumstance in the United Kingdom. Uh, medicinal cannabis is, not, is wholeheartedly supported by the British government. This is a statement from the Home Secretary, so that's the equivalent of, of the Minister of the Interior and the head of the DEA we put together. Um, and you'll, it's interesting to note that he's making a comment which says if the trials, as he believes they will be, are successful, he would recommend to the Medicines Control Agency that the medicine should be authorised. It's very interesting that the head of the Home Office should be talking to the, uh, saying that he's going to recommend to the Department of Health what they should do. And the reason he can do this is this whole programme is sanctioned from, uh, from the Cabinet Office, and that's number 10, that's the, uh, from the Prime, Prime Minister's Office downwards. And this situation pertains in most countries throughout Europe. you have also heard a little bit about Canada as well. So we've uh, been able to take our program forwards with full government support at every step along the way. And that has, indeed has been extremely helpful. I'm sure a lot of you have heard it over the last couple of days about the cannabinoid system, but uh, I usually start presentations to other pharmaceutical companies and other research colleagues by saying, you know, did you realize that there is a mammalian cannabinoid system? The receptors are more abundant than any other receptor system in the body. That uh, activation of those receptors results in some very prime and primordial, <coughs> primordial activities. Uh, Esther will have told you about uh, blocking CB1 receptors in uh, newborn mammals. They just fail to start suckling. Some of the uh, functions of the cannabinoid uh, system really are, go a long way back in the evolution of mammals and humans. And that is further, uh, that view is further enhanced by the fact that the cannabinoid receptor system, the cannabinoids are found presynaptically on a range of uh, neurotransmitting receptors. Uh, there's a very short list here. I don't have a pointer, but I can use the, if you can see, oh, that's right, you can see the PowerPoint pointer. Um, the, uh, Presynaptic, uh, the presence of uh, receptors on, on the presynapse, again, is a very old and evolutionary, a very old uh, um, system. And uh, what is interesting, of course, is sometimes activation of, uh, for example, in GABA is positive in some parts of the brain and negative in others. So uh, you heard this morning, I think, uh, Rui Black talking about it, and it's strange that when the patient wants something to go down, it goes down, and when they want it to go up, it goes up. This system is uh, very much a modulatory system. Uh, Crosstalk with other receptors has been, has been uh, uh, mentioned, endorphin and vanilloid receptors. There are those that consider that the cannabinoid receptors evolutionary were, were evolved from the vanilloid receptors. And organ crosstalk was described last year in the Berlin meeting, uh, inducing inflammation in the bladder and uh, caused upregulation of cannabinoid receptors in the, in the uterus. Uh, some more direct effects, perhaps not uh, receptor mediated, but uh, inhibition of tissue necrosing factor. Uh, that is implemented in uh, rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis, in inflammatory bowel conditions, and indeed in the sequelae of closed head injury and stroke. Um, cannabidiol, a constituent of cannabis, is a potent TNF inhibitor, according to papers published last year, um, as potent as the newest products on the market for rheumatoid arthritis. One should temper one's immediate enthusiasm of that finding, because also so is cod liver oil. Um, but it's interesting to note that the paper we have in UK and we've noticed in some of the lists this morning, vast number of patients with inflammatory conditions uh, uh, reporting improvement from the ingestion of these materials. And here are some potential mechanisms that may be involved. 
And then, of course, you've probably heard of the endocannabinoids, the natural ligand for these receptors, anandamide, furacanolglycerol, uh, nolodine, even more, rec more recently. And the work is now beginning to show a sort of a total circle in so much as CBD is uh, constituent cannabis is now considered to increase the uh, production of 2-AG and, re and inhibit the reuptake uh, uptake of 2-AG. And for the scientists, the medical scientists, that starts to sound just like the stuff of normal pharmaceuticals, normal modern drug. So by now you might, if you're new to this area, none of you are, but uh, I have to talk to a lot of people that are, you start thinking, well, this is interesting. Where would we find a ligand? Where would we find a key to these locks? Where would we find a drug that might have an effect? Well, there's a very convenient source of cannabinoids. In fact, it's the only source of cannabinoids in nature, and that's the cannabis plant. The unique source of cannabinoids, about 60, 63 cannabinoids in it. And you will all know a lot about THC. North American cannabis is uh, the, the most, the principal cannabinoid in North American cannabis is THC. You'll find some THCV, but not a lot else. European cannabis, the, you'll see a lot of more CBD, cannabidiol, about a 50-50 ratio. And if you go back through the literature, as indeed uh, Ethan will have um, described to you, Ethan Russo, Dr. Russo would have described to you, some of the very potent and powerful reports of the effects of cannabis as medicines really occurred in the later years of the 19th century, in the early years of the 20th century. And one to be fairly sure at that time that the patients were not taking High, recre high THC recreational cannabis. So when we start this program, one of the things that I wanted to do was to try and understand what might be the interplay between the ratios of the principal cannabinoid contents, THC and CBD, but without forgetting the potential role of other cannabinoids. And we have uh, useful research quantities from our crops of CBC, CBG, THCV, and uh, CBCB. And CBN, of course, is a degradation product of, of, of cannabinoids, and we thought as a pharmaceutical company we wouldn't have any degradation products in our perfectly <laughs> lovely products. That's certainly a no-no until uh, I think at the ICRS a couple of years ago, there were some very interesting papers on the modulating effect of CBN and some of the pharmacology of CBN itself, and it went straight back into our menu, and we're now looking at the differential contents of C CBN. When we want to look at the relative effects of the constituents of ca cannabis, uh, in whole extracts. It's very important to know that the plants that we're growing are very consistent in terms of their chemical content. I've heard this morning when people talk about sativa and indica, we don't actually use those distinctions. Uh, I think we have in the audience, no he's not here, uh, Rob Clark should be, there he is, Rob at the back, Dave Pate, if he's here. Uh, a debt of gratitude is owed to these gentlemen and their colleagues. Um, for, through the dark years, having worked hard and produced some excellent chemobars, we distinguish our plants mainly by their chemical constituents. Clearly, obviously, the plants have to render themselves useful for economic uh, growing in terms of their size, in terms of their disease uh, resistance, and, uh, and uh, short growing period, and I think Rob may have spoken something about that yesterday. When one looks at our, our high THC variety, if we express the THC content as a proportion of the cannabinoid content of the plant, it's 98%, so that's an excellent bit of, uh, of, of uh, gardening uh, over, the last, uh, over the last 12 years in terms of uh, uh, applying Mendelian genetics. There's no gene splicing or anything that's been involved here. But what is more important is to look at this number here, because this is what the regulators want to see, consistency, a relative uh, cur a coefficient of variation of, uh, of less than 1.4%. The uh, cannabinoid production of these plants is under direct genetic control. It's a direct um, um, product of the plant. It's not a, it's a, an end product or a byproduct of ripening or something else. I'm not sure we know why the plants have the cannabinoids, but if you control the genetics of the plant through specific breeding, you'll control the ratio. Here is the uh, number again for CBD. A recent uh, recent assays uh, in our in our house have. Um, shown that we have now 96% CBD as a proportion of cannabinoids. Look at this coefficient of variation again, 1.2%. So we're beginning to be able to produce starting materials, the likes of which are equivalent to the sorts of materials that, that the regulators throughout the world would normally want to look at. Just as a side, I think the FDA specification for THC in Marinol is only 95% pure, of which 2% can be uh, Delta-8. And uh, of course, that's a racemate, that's two optical isomers. 
Uh, nature is stereospecific. Nature will only produce one optical isomer of, 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 of isomer of a plant. So, a little comment perhaps about quantities of, of, of cannabis. We're currently producing 30 tons a year. Um, and that's wet, three tons dry weight. And we have now just stepped that up to 100 tons. And we have in place the ability to grow 300 tons of cannabis a year. So, so if anybody tells you there's a shortage of these materials worldwide, that's clearly not true. <laughs> um, what is a cannabis-based medicine to us? I firmly believe that the molecules in a plant can work together to provide synergy, and some of them will work to counteract the side effects of the others. If you give THC, pure THC, to a patient, you will get some of the pharmacology, or the, all the pharmacology of THC, you will also get 100% of the side effects of THC. And I think those patients that have used uh, Marinol will, will be witness to that sort of problem. Um, and so we set out to try and describe whether there was synergy in terms of efficacy of these materials. And uh, uh, unlike Mark uh, Ware this morning, who is a true scientist and uh, to be admired greatly, I run somewhat use Bayesian statistics. I work on the basis that my ante is that I believe that we're going to find a product that works, and therefore my research there have, has to, um, in the posterior, show that, show that I've, did, I've demonstrated that. Pharmaceutical companies do not set out to, to, to spend many, many years showing products don't work. Um, and I think that is actually na human nature within, within medicine as well. Uh, for those physicians here, how many of you can prescribe a drug to patients and 10 in a row come back and say it doesn't work, doc? And you say, but the paper in last week's New England Journal of Medicine says it does. Uh, if it's not working the first 6 to 10, you're probably in trouble. So what we do is we extract, make whole extracts of the plants. That's the cannabinoids and the non-cannabinoid constituents. We standardize these to the satisfaction of the international regulatory uh, uh, regulators. And then we measure them precisely for their cannabinoid, both principal and secondary cannabinoid, and their non-cannabinoid constituents. And we then blend them into specific ratios. And it's that standardized material that we can use for trials. This is addressing some of the questions that Mark was bringing up this morning. How can you start comparative trials if you don't know whether you're comparing apples with apples? Um, we, employ, in, in, we incorporate these materials into non-smoke delivery systems, I'll talk about that. From there onwards, it's a solid slog, it's pharmaceutical development. What we have to do is demonstrate to the satisfaction of our peer group of scientists, not to yourselves, because I think most of you are very strong believers, to the satisfaction of our peer group of scientists, objective scientific truth that supports quality, safety and efficacy of these materials. That's my job. That's what I set out to do. I said I'd do that four years ago, and we're on our way to doing that. What is the typical concept of the <laughs> That scientific truth, when published, can be used by anybody anywhere in the world to pursue whichever argument they would wish to pursue. Mm -hmm. What is the um, content, just to show you that we're remaining as true to the plant as we can be? Well, uh, these uh, here is the THC content that I've just shown you before. Sorry, this number's changed now. It's gone up. It's like the old line there in CBD. You'll also see in each of our extracts, you'd have some minor cannabinoids, THCB, CBC, CBN. Uh, to, much to Ethan's uh, pleasure, uh, a range of terpenes, of course. Um, and uh, flavonoids spelt with an O, Ethan. I just corrected that this morning as well. Um, I apparently haven't been able to spell flavonoid for the last few years. <laughs> uh, if, I suppose if that was in a top scientific review, my protocols might have got thrown out on that basis as well. Um, so you've probably gathered that I think cannabinoid ratios are important and that one shouldn't just jump in and use the cannabis that, the, that, that satisfies satiation of a recreational desire. We should think about the cannabis that may be best for the patient, and you've heard some of that from Hilary this morning, and certainly from Valerie, who I've been aware of Valerie's work for a number of years. And uh, <coughs> the next point about, uh, about developing a cannabis-based medicine is to get the delivery right, so you can get consistency of delivery, because it's no point doing comparative studies if you're not comparing apples and apples again. We've heard again this morning that the pharmacology following an inhaled delivery of these materials may be different from a sublingual delivery. That is probably absolutely correct. The, the sequence of events, the, the, the order in which the side, the side effects will occur, 
with a drug will be determined by the rate the, the, and the route of delivery. We see that with a wide range of drugs. So we've formulated in sublingual sprays. These can be used oral mucosally, so any part of the oral mucosa, buccal uh, formulations, and inhalers. Um, just a short note, in the United Kingdom, we were asked by the Home Office, in the middle of all of the enthusiasm to get going, and, by the way, Dr. Guy, how, how can we ensure the patient with the prescription is the one that gets the drug, and uh, how do you stop them having a few friends around on a Friday night? And uh, so we have developed some uh, very simple, well, it's quite actually complex, but the, with the function of simple technology to allow the patient and their drug to be fully identified and only the patient can use the drug. And the amount they use is advised to the patient so the patient can begin to follow and monitor their usage. Someone today, I think Mark was talking about titration over a wide range of doses. I've talked to you about that. There are no two patients that will take the same dose of cannabis. Anybody setting out to do a cannabis-based study on a standard dose will probably fail. Um, so putatively, uh, four years ago, I thought from just what I'd read and what I'd seen, and you know, five years ago, I was new to this whole area. I have no long-term history in, uh, in cannabis-based medicines. Um, I remember speaking at a conference three years ago, and somebody asked me if I'd been indicted. And just... <laughs> Join the club, have you been indicted? <laughs> Once translated the word, I worked out the answer was no. <laughs> um, I put this sort of rough, uh, and hopefully it's been beginning to bear out in our research, um, set of headings. On the left-hand side of this table, it's fairly faint, you'll actually see the cannabinoid ratio, the, the, the predominant cannabinoid. Then the uh, indication, the condition I think that might treat, and then the progress we have made through the trials process in preclinical phase one, phase two, and phase three. Um, as you'll see, uh, I thought that you know, if you've got rip-roaring difficult pain to treat, then high THC is what you need, and you'll probably accept tipping over into some intoxication, euphoria and effect from time to time. That's why I've got the THC up with the cancer pain. These rules are not hard and fast, and many patients will just switch between the others. The physicians of you will also know, for example, when you're treating patients with anti-inflammatories, you start on your favorite or the one that was advised to you by the, uh, by the pharmaceutical representative on his last visit. You work through half a dozen, and where do you end up? Right back at the beginning again. I think with some patients, because of the very tailor-made, and I have to use what that word, not bespoke, it's a British word apparently, the tailor-made approach to treating these patients, the right dose, the right ratio, that we will have to work through a series of products. Not, there's not one size fits all here, and that's another important thing. So what I tend to hear, I've heard up to now, but again with uh, Hillary's presentation, Valerie's presentation, I think we're beginning to see that perhaps there are different types of cannabis and different types of delivery which will suit different types of patients. Um, the vernacular use is one of them, of course. Uh, the THC CBD narrow ratios are the one to one ratios. The ratios that exist in nature and therefore we can rely on the presumption of safety, the many thousand years of use, we haven't produced a mutant ratio that doesn't exist in, in nature. And as we move into the higher CBD ratios, moving towards those anti-inflammatory effects that they have there, but maintaining some of the neurogenic analgesic effects of THC, we'll start moving into some newer areas. The regulators will want to see more data on the bottom of this table and less data at the top of the table. Strange that, isn't it? But that's the case. Anything that looks just like recreational cannabis is the sort of thing that the UK and the European regulators say, well, we know all about that, that's safe. But Dr. Guy, tell us a bit about CBD. We're currently having to undergo, uh, having to carry out two-year toxicity studies for any CBD-containing materials. Um, what about approved clinical indications? If you want to set out and do some clinical trials, you have to get the authorities to let you do them. Suffice to say, here's the ones we've had approved so far, but it's actually easy to say we've had all the ones we've requested approved and approved within 35 days on each and every occasion. The bottom line of a cannabis-based medicine is to produce therapy in the patients in the absence of unwanted side effects. In a lot of our patients, Getting high or stoned is totally unwanted. They do not want to swap one disability of not being able to get out of their wheelchair with another one of not being able to get up on the floor. So, <laughs> what we have to do is find what is called the therapeutic window. The physicians amongst you will know that clearly. It was all uh, explained with theophylins about 20 years ago, and I did a lot of the publications, and then controlled release morphine, which I developed 20 years ago as well. I know I don't look that old, but. <laughs> Um, 
We worked out from day one that there will be a vast inter-individual variation of doses. No two patients will take the same dose. That was on our experience of morphine. I can tell you we have some patients totally controlled on three or four milligrams of cannabinoid equivalent a day, and others needing 120 milligrams a day. So uh, we have to think about patients auto-titrating, but remember if we change the route of delivery, we change their, 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 their dosing cues. What is it they're going to feel? Well, could you repeat those numbers? Your, your From a little one to a big, four to 120. Thank you. Okay. Um, and there's no real clustering. It's right straight across the, straight across the board. Um, the psychoactive effects of cannabis are, are most easily induced by producing a rapid rise of blood levels. That's the case with a lot of other, a lot, lot of drugs. But if you trickle the drug in far more slowly, or do you know about this in skin patches, you can actually load the body up with quite a vast amount of drug, not induce the psychoactive effects, and then what you're dealing with is a patient with profound vasovagal syndrome, postural hypertension, and unconscious looking virtually dead in front of you. Believe me, we know. So you have to be very careful as you start changing your route of administration not to lose those very innocent dosing cues. Nobody died from a small amount of euphoria or intoxication. It is one of the most innocent and best ways for patients to say, I think I've just got to the, 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 the right dose, I'll drop a little bit. We don't want them to be picking themselves up off the floor three hours later and then saying the same. It's a pragmatic issue, it's just straightforward. So, what we need, therefore, is a very precise dosage that the patient will rely on. It's the same every time that they can have a predictable dosage form. That means the oral route is out. Because if you take a product with poor, poor and variable bioavailability, and you have it with a meal or without a meal, you're going to alter your bioavailability and alter the effect of that drug. So we thought that the, um, the oromucosal route, the red, wet, shiny surfaces inside the mouth, you've got these in other parts of the body, in the rectum and in the vagina, uh, this was the route that we felt would be a good route. We didn't go for the inhaled route initially because that means you have to do a ton more toxicology data as well. It's exotic route and it will take another two or three years. We have a, uh, an imperative placed upon us by the British population. 97% of the British approve of medicinal cannabis. get a product on the market, we'll refine it over, over the coming years. We've carried out eight phase one pharmacokinetic studies in 15 different formulations, 60 subjects. And just to confuse you a little bit, don't worry about this slide, it's a bit noisy. Just to make it, uh, to illustrate for you, these were some of the concentration time curves, the blood levels of THC, just as an example. Uh, we can show you the same CBD, they, they parallel these exactly, but tend to be about half the level, uh, with a number of different formulations. This one was an inhaled aerosol. Uh, we told them to take some inhalations and then see if they were all right. So they went down again, then up again. Not very good at bioavailable. Look, the level's here at about 10 nanograms. Not very good. The patients coughed themselves to bits on this. We found exactly the same as Donald Tashkin found and any other author has found when they try and put a, a cannabinoid into an aerosol. You induce a cough reflex straight away. It is not a viable way of moving ahead. Um, the blue here, the green, and the yellow are all uh, sublingual sprays, but with very, very slight, subtle formulation differences. Between the yellow and the blue, you've doubled the bioavailability, so a patient who's just controlled their dose, they go off to go and teach school during the day, or drive to the shop, if, you, if they take the blue instead of the yellow, they're not going to be able to do it. So also beware when you make up the tinctures, be very, very standardized in, in your approach. The blue down here and the gray, our, um, our uh, sublingual, uh, sublingual tablet, a buckle tablet, and this is a propellant aerosol, very poor indeed. If we're going to compare the effects of THC and CBD, principally as they're in an extract, and in combination, we have to know whether there's a marked impact on the pharmacokinetics of THC by CBD. The literature says there is. Best born Heinz showed that uh, brain uh, levels of THC were modified uh, three times in the presence of CBD, actually, and the other way around. Um, if you follow me here, here, you see that? that those, these, this red curve is the THC levels are of um, in patients, uh, in, in volunteers, and these are the CBD levels when given a one to two ratio THC CBD in these doses, 24 and 48 milligrams, uh, sublingually. Here is the THC level when given purely in a THC extract, and here's a CBD level given the CBD extract. The bottom line is, 
The combination is increasing the bioavailability of THC a little, by about 33%, and decreasing the bioavailability of, of CBD by about 18%. To all intents and purposes, that doesn't worry me in the ensuing studies. If it was three times, four times, or an order of magnitude, then I would have to think about uh, some very careful dose-ranging uh, studies in order to do any comparisons. And just for those of you that uh, uh, think about the inhaled route, we have made our specific extracts. We have then taken micro dots of those extracts, something like 30 microliters, and applied a computer algorithm through a chip to those to impart just the right energy to vaporize the volatile components. Therefore, you have no, no carcinogens whatsoever. We've assessed and tested for all the 17 normal ones. And what you actually have is a vapor. Uh, a vapor has no particle size. Therefore, will not induce uh, a cough reflex. And so, uh, I think a lot of you will have been hearing about that in the back of the room. So, um, I would also say to Mark, are you here, Mark? Yeah. Yeah, your estimates, I think, are three times too high in terms of the delivery from cannabis. We did, um, about three years ago, we put a lot of cannabis joints of different varieties through cannabis, uh, through uh, tobacco smoking equipment and analyzed the, the cannabinoid, tar, and other constituent delivery per puff. And the information is very interesting. We'll let you know about that. But about, about a couple of milligrams come out of the standard joint between four and 800, um, the 400 milligram joint at about 10% uh, THC. Uh, the literature says 20. Uh, you won't be able to stand up 20 milligrams. This is 1.7 milligrams inhaled from our vaporizer. The subject said, well, doc, you know, it's, it's all right, but not very much. So I said, fine, you will come back here in six weeks' time and we'll give you a bit more. <laughs> These people were so stoned that we had to close the windows because, uh, because their, uh, their heart rate had gone up to about 170. So in a way, I never done a look at the way they broke into absolute paroxysms laughter. <laughs> a great achievement for us because we, what we have here is the electronic, non-carcinogenic, healthy, safe joint. Except we have to think about the pharmacology here. Do I want to be giving this first dose to a 60-year-old with a slightly weak heart? So again, one has to be very careful. Your enthusiasm to spread these materials as widely as possible through patient populations you have to be tempered a little bit with what is going to happen in those people that don't normally or regularly take, take these, these materials. And if I want to do that in giving these materials to a 65-year-old, I'm going to have to do clinical trials in 65-year-olds. I can't do it in you know, 20 to 30-year-olds and, and translate on from there. Um, look at these levels. Those other ones I showed you are 10 milligrams. We're up to the 120, uh, nearly 120, sorry, nanograms per mil. And for those of you who have read that uh, the kinetics of the cannabinoids are highly variable, they're variable because all the studies being done, they haven't had a clue how much cannabinoid they've been delivering. We know exactly what we do with 1.7 uh, uh, milligrams or 5.3 in this case uh, mean. Look at these error bars for those of you who understand them. This is type data. It's a very good route of delivery. I only wish we had a little further forward in development. There will be a role for both the sublingual routes, the oromucosal uh, routes, and the, uh, the inhaled route. But the relative effects of the cannabinoids and the ratios will change. I'm no, I have no doubt about that. So we have to be very careful to switching from one to another. I'm going to show you some results now of some clinical trials. Uh, the first three were done to a, court, to a, to a, trial, to a design that I'll uh, just uh, let you know about, I'll tell you about in a little while. This one here is, uh, was done at the, um, uh, uh, sorry, this, this one was Dr. Nutcutt. I think you know about Dr. Nutcutt. He's a pain specialist. His patients have multiple sclerosis, spinal cord injury. Professor Wade, Professor of Rehabilitation at Oxford University in the UK. He, his unit, the Rivermead uh, unit, gives its name to the Rivermead Rehabilitation Index, uh, which he invented. Uh, Spalding Bolter, our own doctors in our own unit. Dr. Fowler is a world expert on uh, bladder uh, innovation. She is a uro-neurologist at the Inst uh, Institute of Urology, uh, Neurology at Queen Square in London. That's the National Hospital for Disease and Nervous System. This is, we're recruiting the best uh, hospitals in the UK. And the last little study was uh, done in Leicester. Uh, having thought about the literature and some of the problems that naive patients get when they first smoke or uh, meet uh, these materials, I didn't want to upset a randomized, blinded study with them, with patients learning how to use them. So what we did in our first three studies, we used a within patient uh, trial design. Uh, they had two weeks of uh, getting used to the medicines. Every time they had a new medicine, they spent the whole day in hospital, monitored to do that, followed by a period where they took one of these four medicines, either THC extract, CBD extract, or the one-to-one, -one or placebo, 
double-blind, randomized, controlled fashion. Uh, in Dr. Knockcut's study, they had a week at a time, and when they'd done four weeks, we re-randomized them, they had another four weeks, a very, very uh, tight study, and then they were allowed to extend for the long-term period if they'd got benefit. Just to show you, these are the results. These have been published, they're available. Uh, Dr. Knockcut has published these. Um, what we found when we looked at mean difference score in, the, in this group of patients, this was 16 patients with Dr. Knockcut, is that the uh, THC CBD was uh, superior in this area and the uh, and statistically significant. For those of you not familiar with this, when we see p values on the screen here, they have to be less than 0 0.5, less than a 1 in 20 chance of just having arrived at, uh, at the answer by chance. This was really very encouraging, a very small study with these numbers. And if you get these sorts of uh, p values in small studies, it could indicate, could just be a chance, so bear in mind these are very early days, could indicate you've got quite a marked uh, change there. Here's an interesting point. In these group of patients, the THC didn't seem to do so well, but this was fascinating. Although only a trend, the CBD controlled the neuropathic pain entirely in two of the patients in this group. And we bore that in mind. We had added the CBD extract in really as a positive control at this point of the program. We were thinking about it for uh, epilepsy, for schizophrenia, and bipolar disorders. And I think you've heard a little bit about that. We didn't expect to see anything from it. When you ask the patient, somebody said uh, patients do more activity, that's exactly right. They don't sit and dutifully score their pain scores down and down each day. They've had so much compromise that what they actually do is they go out and do more. Patient number two, who was wheelchair chair bound for eight years, went out and mowed his lawn two days later in his wheelchair, and his pain scores went through the roof. <laughs> um, so you have to look, when you look at pain scores, you have to look at activity levels, quality of life scores, all these other issues. So we have a composite score which says, Taking all these issues into account, how well has the treatment controlled your symptoms? Zero is total control, six is no control at all. And you'll see here in the randomized period, these last four bars on the right-hand side of your screen, placebo, the pink one, is the worst control, which is interesting. In none of our studies so far has placebo been an improvement over active. If the placebo was working, active wasn't, you'd expect to see that by chance from time to time. And look, one-to-one -one again down here, is superior, and uh, for those of you who are uh, familiar with p-values, this is strongly significant. I think you can begin to start believing this result. My sci the scientific community won't yet believe it, <laughs> but I think you can start to believe that. Here's your CBD trending towards that 0 0.5. If we'd done twice as many patients, perhaps it would have been there. And here's the uh, THC. Good old THC is now proving its metal under, under this, uh, under this uh, scenario. We asked them about their sleep. Hey doc, I've had the best night's sleep I've had in years. Is that, was that a direct effect on sleep or was it because their pain had gone, you'd muscle relax them, or they weren't getting up to go to the toilet all night? Um, I guide your attention to the baseline here, average sleep, the placebo number in the here, which is about the same. Let's ignore the one-to-one -one, because that's open to bias, that word that Mark used, because the patients knew what they are taking. But when they were blinded, here's the one-to-one, -one, here's the THC, here's the uh, CBD. And the one-to-one, -one, this difference here, is actually statistically significant. Ah, but I hear some of the cynics say, the reason they were sleeping so long, Dr. Guy, is they were stoned. <laughs> <laughs> you tend to sleep after general anaesthetic, don't you? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so... We asked them, what about your sleep quality? They said, oh, well, it's very good, actually. And here, the same, the same, uh, the same uh, rigor pertains here. On the basis of this, we now had a medicine that seemed to take away pain and provide sleep. If you read the bottle, the label on a patented bottle of cannabis from 100 years ago, that's exactly what it said. So I don't think we can congratulate ourselves on having discovered it. <laughs> but what we did do is, Oh, hum. We've got something that takes away pain but provides sleep. The authority is going to ask us about that sleep. Is it normal architecture? Have you removed remedy? <coughs> we commissioned a full sleep laboratory study. You have to stay in the laboratory 12 nights in a row. We produced nearly four kilometers of EEGs. <laughs> and, uh, I can't, uh, we've just got the results through. We'll publish later on. Basically, THC is not uh, affecting sleep architecture abnormally. Um, that, uh, that CBD is slightly alerting, and I think someone this morning said that and, uh, just from, the, from what the patients told them, and that when you add, uh, but there was some post-drone effect of THC, some effects on memory, cognition, and simple reaction times the morning after, but when you add the CBD in, they disappeared. 
So again, this is further proof that CBD is, is ameliorating or attenuating some of those effects of THC. So for some patients, don't give them THC on their own. Now we switch from the east coast of England right over to uh, Oxford, at Venerable's uh, state. This data is hot off the press. You are the first people in the world to see this. Uh, it is uh, being written up as a study. I can't show you all the data, but here I'll show you two slides. These patients are severe multiple sclerosis, all of them severe multiple sclerosis. Kurska score 6.57, wheelchair bound or bed bound. And uh, we thought, well, we'll try the, go for the, for the holy grail and look at all the symptoms, the principal symptoms of MS in these patients. And what you'll see on these slides are the visual analog scores. The patients are invited to score the severity of their condition along a 10 centimeter line. One end says no problem at all, the other one says the worst ever. And uh, and in, in Oxford, a higher number is an improvement. So you'll see the baselines <coughs> in the light blues along here, no baseline there, I don't know why. Uh, the open one-to-one, -one, let's discount that because that's open to bias. But look at this here, that's CBD. There, 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 and there. Suddenly this Cinderella molecule that nobody was interested in, uh, some people have said it have no roots at all, seem to be having a marked effect on these patients, <coughs> as was THC, as was the combination. And here's placebo down here. A little bit worrying to me that there isn't a marked placebo effect, so have they spotted the placebo, as Mark said? We probably don't think so, we, uh, but some of these effects were marked. In about 4 out of 20 patients that we see going through the studies, we truly change lives. Uh, and any of you who have seen the Panorama program, that's probably our equivalent to your 48 minutes, and it lasts about 45, well, the 48 hours you have this, right? Uh, a lady that had had a ductus spasm could not separate her legs for about 10 years, got onto a horse and rode it. Um, very interesting. But then we have to think about, yes, so there's potential efficacy. In this group of patients, we're probably seeing a different, uh, different type of efficacy, and we can't explain that at the moment. You know, why is the combination better in one group and not in the others? And that'll be the subject of further research. Um, here's the intoxication score, the visual analog score uh, from the patients on their level of intoxication. Bearing in mind, we were asking them to push the dose to what they could. First we'll look at placebo on the far right there, so even on placebo they thought that you know, they had a 9 out of 100 score. Uh, the THC is up the top, not surprising, and the CBD and the one-to-one the CBD and the one -to -one are slightly less. There's no statistical significance there and we'll have to see larger groups, but again something interesting to see. But let's be clear here, I've heard some criticism of, of, of our stance here. If one takes too much of our medicines, you'll get exactly the same side effects in terms of euphoria and intoxicating effects as if one is smoking cannabis. So we say that you, it is not necessary to do that to get the side effects, it is effective, and that, that's the stance we take. And in a way I'm quite pleased, I'd rather they have those sort of side effects than the side effects you find from Marinol, because it means we would have failed to bottle the essence of cannabis. <laughs> Uh, Chairman's indulgence, I'll continue just for a little while over my time, because a lot of you were late back from lunch, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> Queen Square in London is the most prestigious neurological centre in the UK, probably in Europe. There's a whole department dedicated to the neurology of the bladder. Bladder dysfunction in multiple sclerosis patients is very worrisome and, very, and a very difficult and troubling symptom. At Queen Square, we looked at 21 patients who were candidates for indwelling, permanent indwelling catheter. They were at the end of the road, and once you have a permanent indwelling catheter, your life expectancy drops. So it's a life-threatening condition in terms of the instrumentation of the bladder. And uh, we uh, carried out an open study, so it's open to quite a considerable amount of period effect and bias, uh, but I'll show you the data in any case. If we look at the mean number of incontinence episodes in these patients, and something I want to say, in the previous two studies, these patients came to us having failed on every other medicine, but still taking all those other medicines. So placebo isn't placebo alone, it's all of their other standard medicines. Sorry, I forgot to tell you that. Um, and here these patients came to us, these are the incontinence episodes. You might think that's not very high, but these patients have long-term, well-thought-out strategies, and they're never very far from the loo, from the toilet. Eight weeks of combination goes down and the THC, and again, I invite you to look at the p-values. Even in this small group here, it's really quite impressive data and was very, very appealing to us when we saw it. The same sort of thing pertains when we look at eight weeks of one-to-one -one followed by eight weeks of THC. 
um, you see that uh, the THC result here is, that it is significant, one to one isn't. There's a lot more variation about this number. And again, be guarded, these are small numbers in early days. But uh, this is borne out by what we saw in the patients. Uh, and looking at daytime frequency episode, again the same. Ah, but you might say, if I asked all of you how many times you went to the toilet yesterday, most of you will get the answer wrong. <laughs> you know, any, any young medic that's been taught to take history, you know, probe that question. Are you sure, Mrs. Smith, it was 14 times, was it? <laughs> so what we also did is we did serial systemetrogram. We measured the, uh, the systemetric capacity of the bladder. This is something you cannot muff up with uh, yourself, if you, whether you know the product of placebo or not. And uh, again, what we see after um, uh, eight weeks of one-to-one uh, -one treatment, and I must explain this curve a little bit, after eight weeks of treatment, we stopped the treatment for 24 hours and then measured the capacity to see whether we had induced any chronic changes. And then we gave them the dose they should have taken and then measured two hours later. And you can see that this is a piffingly small bladder. This is less than two hours of urine output from the kidney. These people really cannot hold their urine at all. And uh, after, after eight weeks of treatment, they have a meaningful increase, which is statistically significant, and it bears out the, um, the uh, results we see. And we see the same sort of thing with THC, but not that acute effect. It seems to be perhaps quite, so therefore we might talk about two different mechanisms going on in the presence of CBD. Professor Roger Pertwee, who has recently joined us as our Director of Pharmacology, is looking very much into these bladder mechanisms at the moment with CBD. I think I'll skip over, um, because of time allows, skip over um, post-operative pain. Suffice to say, we found some analgesia in post-operative pain. In England, we give PCA analgesia, patient-controlled analgesia, morphine. They choose their dose for 24 hours after the <coughs> operation. It's, the ceiling is usually reached by the nausea induced by the morphine. Cannabinoids are antiemetic. They're, off, they're um, opiate sparing. They're also muscle relaxant and slightly and they have some cholinergic effects, which are drying secretions. Isn't that a sort of a perfect perioperative drug? We're just about to do some big perioperative studies in the UK. So if I told you these were the findings, I don't suppose many of you would really dispute that at present. There are those that would do, and we have to do much larger studies. But I will tell you that uh, of the first 109 patients into these studies, 88 completed the acute phase, and 86 of those went on to take long-term treatment. As of today, two of them have just gone past two years of treatment, continuous treatment on our materials. This gives you the curve of the safety data. So I've told you about efficacy, but you've got to think about safety. Can the patients tolerate materials? We now have over 120 patient years of experience with these materials. And because our phase three studies are running at a rate, we're building that up at 30 patient years per month at the present. So we will meet the internet, our regulatory requirements for safety about this time next year or a little bit earlier. So bye. What we do with the UK regulated authorities early on is we would treat a patient and when they got to the end of, uh, say, four weeks or, or six months and the authority said you can't go any further, we would review each patient with the authorities and go ahead. The Committee of Safety of Medicines in the UK has now reviewed the data and we have 20, uh, permission to treat all our patients for at least 24 months. Uh, we have had some serious um, treatment-related adverse events. All the other adverse events are what we would expect. They're early on and the patient, once they dehydrate, uh, really doesn't have a problem. Those 12 uh, serious late adverse events were not life threatening and didn't cause death, but did cause the patient to have to come back to hospital to reassess or remain in hospital. Um, I haven't listed them, but I'm uh, happy to say, uh, share those with you. When we look at the adverse events, and this is very strict in the pharmaceutical, we have to record everything, whether it's really, if we think, if the doctor thinks it may be related to our product. When we look at adverse events of, of our products, I just draw your attention to this line. On THC, 51% of the patients reported adverse events. On the one-to-one, 26.1. That is statistically significantly different. So a couple of the hypotheses we're thinking about. Can we induce synergy by adding, by, by altering the ratios? And can we diminish the side effects? We're beginning to see that not in the, across all of our studies. Just finally to tell you what's in progress at the moment. We have just finished the recruitment of 161 patients into a multiple sclerosis study, double blind parallel group study, that last patient will complete in eight weeks time. Results later in the year. In addition to that, uh, we have a neuropathic uh, pain in a multiple sclerosis study underway. Uh, uh, spasticity and MS just about to start, all of those looking at the THC CBD. We're going back to Queen Square to repeat or to look at a study in 110 subjects looking at the bladder dysfunction. 
our pain and sleep study, the earlier slides I showed you, that worked very well in 16, so why not go back and do it again in the group? 54 subjects, I think that'll be enough. Uh, that's halfway underway, half recruited now. Neuropathic pain and spinal cord is at the Stoke Mandeville Center for uh, Spinal Cord Injury, one of the world's most famous centers. Neuropathic pain with allodynia, I think Mark has talked about allodynia. It's pretty well difficult to find, but uh, we have a group in Liverpool of 60 patients that had just come out of the study a year ago and they're going to slot into one of ours. Brachial plexus avulsion, young men falling off their motorcycles, ripping their arm off, producing pure neuropathic pain in their arm. Used to be cavalry officers coming off their horses, but it's now it's motorcyclists. That's half completed as well. Cancer pain, uh, a big study there, 100 patients underway. So um, in terms of moving ahead, these are the areas that we're moving into next, rheumatoid arthritis studies starting in the next uh, two months, and inflammatory bowel. We're not forgetting glaucoma, there are other mechanisms. Ocular, the, the intraocular pressure is not the whole story in glaucoma. That's not the thing that makes you go blind. It's the effects on the optic nerve and the microvascular, the vascular of the optic nerve. Think about some of the mechanisms, nitric oxide mechanisms and neuroprotective mechanisms of the cannabinoids in terms of protecting someone's sight. <coughs> pressure isn't everything in that, in, in, in that area. I think Esther Fried has told you about cystic fibrosis. We will be doing a study with Esther. Uh, where are you, Esther? We really will be. <laughs> So we get a little bit less busy with all our other things. And uh, uh, acute mania, I think someone else mentioned bipolar disorders and acute mania this morning. So in summary, we've had positive results from phase two trials, which is very encouraging. It certainly encourages us to continue on with the research. Significant improvements, uh, excellent safety profile. We are beginning to show some differentiation between the different varieties and the strains that we're putting in. We have seven phase three studies running, which will incorporate 730 patients. One of them is now fully recruited. We have over 250 patients in those studies. In total at the moment, we have over 300 patients taking our medicines uh, in different forms. And uh, I think that cannabinoid ratio specific therapeutic themes are beginning to emerge. Just watch this space over the next 12 to 18 months and we'll probably be able to fill in some of that uh, uh, information. Thank you very much for this.